So we're going to wrap up what we began four weeks ago, things called G- things I wish Jesus never said. And before we do, I, I want to just ask you to take a moment, take a deep breath, and-, and allow us a moment of silence and then a closing prayer as we get into our message. So take a deep breath with me. Come, Holy Spirit, hear our prayers. God, somehow, some way today, through message or through story, through song or through silence, hear a word from you, a word of maybe clarity or a word of disturbance, a word of hope or a word of peace. Come into our ever-changing world, Lord, and change us more and more into the people you've created us to be. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you haven't been with us over the last four weeks, uh, I encourage you to go out to our website. You can catch up on those. And again, this Wednesday at 630, you can join us for one more group session around the things I wish Jesus never said. And and so some of the things that he's said that we've talked about are things like... uh, that you're going to have to hate your father and mother and your brother and your sister. We've looked at that. We, we looked at what he said about following him meant to actually to deny yourself and to take up your cross, which to those first people meant a cross was a thing that was actually taking you to your death uh, and to follow him. Last week was about him saying that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and each of them, while while a little bit harsh on the surface, especially to people 2,000 years ago. I hope that as we've gotten into it, we've been able to say that, you know what, I kind of am glad Jesus said these things, that that I'm kind of glad because maybe it has changed something in you and your perspective. That is my hope, is that these words have challenged you, but but that you haven't let them just go in one ear and out the other, um, that you haven't just heard what I've said and simply tuned it out, but you will actually then take it into your life beyond the moments that we have here in person or throughout the week online. So today we're going to finish this up by talking about what Jesus had to say about the poor. Why? Because Jesus had a lot to say about the poor among us. In fact, from the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus was clear about his heart for the poor. After Jesus' baptism, he is baptized by John the Baptist. He he goes out into the Judean wilderness for 40 days and night to prepare himself for what's to come. And when that preparation time is over, Jesus comes back home to the town of Nazareth where he grew up. He goes to his local church on the Sabbath day, which for them is Saturday. But it's like coming home here for the first time in a long time. He, He goes there to church. He is asked to be Wanda. The, the scripture reader, he's there, they hand him a scroll to read, and then this is what it says. Jesus stood up to read, he, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then it says, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And then the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he began to say to them, which wasn't in the scriptures, by the way, he said, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So at at this point, early in, in, in his ministry, his mission is clearly centered around fulfilling the words of the ancient prophet Isaiah. And that would become to known around Jesus throughout his whole ministry. And right from the start, it is about being anointed to bring what he says in the very first line, good news to the poor. And so, to really understand Jesus and to follow Jesus, we have to understand and embrace what he means about the poor. And so to do that, we actually have to start with the end. And by end, I mean end of times. You ever think of the end of times? In fact, I've been thinking about it lately so much so that I think next year I'm going to preach about it. Um, Hollywood has a bunch of great ideas about what the end of times looks like or this dystopian future or the end of days. The Bible has fascinating teachings about it too. And, and, And it seems that no matter what part of history 
you've lived in, you've kind of always had this feeling that the end might be near, right? And so Jesus, when he's, he's talking about what it means to deal and to live with people who are poor, he starts first by talking about the end of times. He is there with a bunch of people. They're asking him questions about the end of days. What is it going to look like? And then he starts to describe what that future day, when everything ends, will consist of. And here's how it started. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats, which was common in that time. The shepherds at night would separate the sheep and the goats from one another, so they knew what he was talking about. He said he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. To you, I think this is the right and that is the left. He says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance because the kingdom is prepared for you since the creation of the world. He's saying that since everything started, there was this place that was made just for you, which, which sounds pretty good, right? I mean, if you're a sheep, it sounds pretty good. Jesus is saying that... Yeah, throughout all of this, yes, people are going to bow down, all the nations will bow down, and, but, but for anyone who follows, they get this inheritance. They get this incredible inheritance. And if he would have ended it right there, it would have been like, yes, I love what Jesus said, but he doesn't end it there. In fact, when you read Jesus' words, he rarely ever ends it where you want him to end it. He continues on. He says, because when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. And you may have heard this before. He says, when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I needed clothes, you clothed me. When I was sick, you looked after me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. And then the righteous, the sheep, the the people that are all a part of his kingdom will answer, Lord, when did we actually see you hungry and invite you in? When needing clothes and we clothed you? When when were you thirsty and we gave you something to drink? When were you a stranger and we we brought you in? When were you sick or in prison and we went to visit you? It it sounds like the people he's talking about right there would have been a little bit confused. Like, okay, Jesus, we get all this, but when have we physically actually seen you uh, in this way? When has that happened? And and then Jesus continues on. He says, the king will, will reply, says, truly, I tell you, whenever you did this, For one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, then you've done this for me. Now, now many of you grew up in church, and you've heard this one before, right? If you've heard this story, please let me know. If you're online, put a little thing. So, So these words are not necessarily new, but hopefully they will come into better understanding. Because then he continues on, he says, then he will say to those on the left, the goats, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. He says, because when I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. And when I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. And when I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And then they will also answer, he said, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty? or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and we didn't help. Jesus, when did we ever see you like this, and we just ignored you, is what they're saying. And then he will reply, Jesus says, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, while the righteous go to eternal life. Wow. So, for many of us, we, we've heard this many times throughout our life, but for the people who were there that day, for the very first time, this was a little, a little abrasive. I mean, was Jesus talking in just like a metaphor, or, or maybe this was hyperbole, or, or, or some kind of overstatement? Well, I mean, what is it? I kind of think Jesus was just talking plainly here. Uh, I kind of think he's talking pa- plainly, even though his message seems a little harsh. It is clear, right from the start, to Jesus and his followers, that they are to care and and serve other people, especially the poor. Jesus had a a particular mission, a a bent around the poor and the oppressed people. Yes, he taught a message of repentance and and of forgiveness. He he talked about God's love and about people needing to turn towards God, very personal things. He talked about people needing to be obedient to the Father. But at the same time, it is clear 
throughout Jesus' life and through his teachings, through his message, that there was a responsibility that goes beyond just what we do for ourselves. And, and even more so, what we do for others. You see, stories of Jesus, they depict him repeatedly reaching out to the people at the bottom of the social pyramid of his day. It's actually one of the ways his followers knew that he was the Messiah. In part, because again, he, rode, he read from the prophet Isaiah, the prophet who was, who was actually predicting the Messiah that was to come, saying that they anointed to bring good news to the poor. And so they saw that because Jesus was bringing good news to the poor, he must have been the Messiah. And Jesus called his followers then to do the same and today. It's a pretty good job to have, right? But I got to tell you, it's a little bit challenging. You see, each of us need to be able to answer for ourselves, um, what do I do for the poor? Or what do I do with the poor around us? And, and yes, or organizations need to, but personal uh, beliefs and convictions come to bear in this. And it's interesting to me that when Jesus talked about the day of judgment, the final day, he made it personal. He, he wasn't talking about a, a group or a nation. He was talking about individuals. He says that whenever we individually overlook the people who are hungry or thirsty or, or in need or, or naked or sick or in prison, when we ignore them, we ignore Jesus himself. And then what he describes is when we do that, we will face judgment for our lack of care. And, and, and listen, I... I don't think anybody that I know of intentionally goes through life neglecting people who are in need. I don't know of a single person who wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I think I'm going to ignore people in need today. But if you're like me, life gets busy. Life gets chaotic. And, and it's tough to see the people that are in need. Listen, there are need all around us in the world, wherever you live, no matter where, no matter how affluent in a place you live or how poor in a place you live. And when we don't do something about it, when we don't help others in need, it, it might as well be us turning our backs on Jesus himself. That's what he teaches. Have you ever thought of it that way? I know I don't think about it very often that way. But, but I struggled. And I know that Jesus sees me struggle in this. You see, I think that Jesus is saying to be a follower that we are called to love others as we are wanting to be loved. We are called to serve those in need just as Jesus did. So, but we have to do it in very practical ways. And I don't know about you, I'm a list person. I have to come up with, with ways so that I know that I, I, I'm doing what I need to do. And, and so to, to be able to do this... I, one of the first things I want you to know is you got to start noticing. Take notice. This is something that I pray regularly. I pray when I get up in the morning, God save me. Not because I'm worried about my salvation, by the way, but because I know myself. God save me. Save me for myself. Save me for what's to come. And help me see is what I say. Take notice. Whether you recognize it or not, we in America, in our society, are very rich. No matter what income bracket you live in, we are very rich. Because when you realize that half of the world lives on $2 a day or, or less, it's hard to argue that we're not. But the key to this teaching of Jesus, it, it isn't about the amount of money that you have or the amount of money that you give away. It, it really starts with the point of do you actually look and see what's around you and who's around you? Because when you see needs around you, whether they're big or they're small, the question then is, is does it affect you? Does it break your heart or, or do you ignore them? Do you care? Does it bother you? Because the reality is you need to know it bothers Jesus. It bothers Jesus whenever people are hurting or people are poor. And one of the challenges I think that we all have is seeing this need, I, I think it just goes by us. Now, we do whenever a commercial comes on and, and we see a commercial and there's a third, what we call a third world country or developing country where there's massive poverty and people are hungry and people are thirsty, and, but we don't necessarily see it right around us. I think it presents a challenge to us because unless I turn on the TV for the most part, I don't see it with my own eyes. And to further compound this problem, Something I mentioned earlier, I, I'll speak for myself. I just get busy. I am too busy. My calendar is too packed. 
There, there's things that I've got to get done in conversations that I've got to have. There's activity after activity to be a part of. So all of that stuff piles on, and guess what it does? It makes it difficult to actually see the world around us. So do you intentionally try to take notice? Maybe. Maybe not. But listen, don't just wish that the needs of the world would jump out and be more clearly. Don't just wish that all of a sudden you will see them because when you do, there will be something asked of you. Listen, I believe in order for us to to be able to see the world more clearly, we actually have to ask for help. That's part of our prayer. And, and I'm assuming, I hope that you pray every day, that you have a prayer life. You know, we, we, we pray to God's Holy Spirit that, that he will come and he would give us what we need to be able to see. Because without that, it is hard for me to notice. And I'm a pastor, by the way. And pastors, we're supposed to be perfect, right? Okay, when I've said that before, you guys laughed at me. Listen, it, it is hard to see and so we need help we need assistance another reason why i believe um, we don't take notice of the opportunity to serve the poor is is we're so focused on our own needs i mean we've all got needs we've all got things that, that are wearing us out and stressing us out our needs and our wants and sometimes we think to ourselves you know whatever i get my house in order right when i get everything lined up then i'll be able to to have margin and time in life to be able to notice and to help those who are poor or oppressed but listen when we follow the greatest commandment which is to love god when all of a sudden we start to love god and that is our focus then what happens is the thing that god focuses on becomes the things that we focuses on the, the things god Desires, the things that break God's heart begins to be the things that break our hearts and become our desires. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, you see a world in need. And so I'd say that it, if it was important enough to Jesus to take notice and look for opportunities, then I'd say it's important for us to do the same, to make time, to pray about it, to lean into the Holy Spirit. Listen, sometimes it won't make sense when you're feeling something to find somebody. You know that nudge, I think we call it nudge. I like to call it nagging. I've been told by professors that you shouldn't talk about the Holy Spirit nagging you because it's not a, a good term. But, but listen, the Holy Spirit's gonna nag you about somebody. It could be somebody that, you, that you've noticed on social media. It could be somebody at work or church or maybe a parent of a child at the school. Maybe somebody you're in class with. Listen, follow those nudges. Check on them, send messages, send texts. That's what I do. When one of you pops in my head, I send you a message. I send you a text. I know it can be annoying. Uh, no, I'm not snooping. Uh, but I feel a snudge from the Holy Spirit, so I check on people. So listen, af after you've done that, after you take notice of things, you actually then have to do something with it, right? The old story about the, the, the two frogs on the log, and, and one of them decided to jump in the river. How many are still on the log? Two, right? Because it actually takes action before you, you know, it has nothing to do with decision. We have to take action with things. You see, clearly the response that Jesus had to those was to take action to, towards some of the poorest, the sickest. The people who were considered unclean, Jesus actually walked towards and physically touched. Listen, if you look at what John said, John wrote letters in the New Testament, he said this, he warns us, he says, if somebody has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, so they see it, but they show no compassion, then how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. So after we've taken notice, we know there's a need in somebody's life or in their family or in a group. It goes beyond that, right? Often, if you're like me, we think we notice a need and we pray about it and we pray, God, please send somebody else. But no, we're to go. We have to seek those opportunities. We, we must not just notice, but actually do. Right? Listen, I want to encourage you this too as well. If you notice something, don't tell somebody that you're going to go fill a need for them. Just go do it. And here's the reason why. This is a practical one for me. If you're anything like me, I may very well tell you, hey, I'm going to take care of this for you. And then my calendar gets crazy and I forget, right? And I've 
gotten your hopes up and, and you were hopeful that, that, okay, you're in a time of need and I'm going to be there to help and, and then I blow it. Listen, just, just do it. Go and, and help somebody. With, with every encounter that we have, those people who follow Jesus, it, it helps us either bring people closer to who Jesus is or to push them farther away. So we have to decide and follow through. I think that we have to remember to do these things. And when we do, it's not just about our own strength, by the way. As I mentioned earlier, I think this takes courage to use this in your prayer life, to ask the Holy Spirit to come and guide you on this. Because when we experience that and we experience those names and those nudges to take action, all of a sudden we are energized to do something that we were never thought possible in our lives. Now, listen. We love to think that we can follow the disciples in all this, right? But we know from the story of the disciples that when Jesus was arrested and, and, and he was crucified, that, that they left, right? Prior to that, you know what they saw? They saw Jesus feeding thousands of people. They saw Jesus raising people from the dead, healing the sick. And yet when Jesus wasn't there, they scattered and they were freaked out. But listen, when Jesus was resurrected, and then Jesus told them, guess what, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you the advocate. And because of that Holy Spirit, you will have power to do all of these things. Because that happens, all of a sudden they become who Jesus created them to be. And because of that, we are here. How Christians treated the poor and the sick and the imprisoned and the naked is what ultimately changed their world and changed our world. So, we've talked about noticing, we've talked about taking action, but I'm going to tell you as a church, we do what we can to try to help you find ways to do that. There's another thing I want to talk more about here in the future that I want you to know that, that we're called to do a couple different things in life when we notice a need, and that is one, provide relief. But the other is restoration. And the difference between those two is relief is that immediate thing. You know, a tornado has come through, you immediately help somebody out. We're good at that. We're really good at relief. You, you hear a song, you see something, you give a few dollars for it, you, you notice all of a sudden it made a difference. But restoration is difficult. You see, restoration is actually being consistent over time with relationships. That's one of the things I love about the Methodist Church. We've got this thing that we call, we just abbreviate it, UMCOR. It's the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And they are the group that goes into places where there is need and they stay for the long term. That's about restoration. That's what we're called to do, to be in connection in relationships that restore people. And one of the ways we do that here through Keystone with a handful of you actually serve at a place called Neighbor to Neighbor. And a couple weeks ago, I, I took the week off, but I did go down there for the morning and I visited with their leader, Gregory Parr. And they're an organization that, that helps people who are struggling with poverty and homelessness and addiction. And, and listen, their mission is not just to provide something for that one particular day. Their mission is to help people overcome that. Those people who want to step out of poverty or addiction, that is their mission. And you're going to hear more about them at the end of the month because I've invited Greg to come and share some of his stories. Another group that we connect with once a month is Harvesters, who provides food assistance to those who are at risk nutritionally in our city. And, and you can sign up through our website to do that on the first Saturday of the month. And, and listen, there, there's all sorts of ways that you can serve. In fact, I hear about some of these from you. It doesn't have to be one that the church connects to. So I would tell you, when you see a need, fill it, serve. But then I would also ask you to write me a note or to tell me. Why? Well... Because I'm nosy, for one. <laughs> no, it's because I love to hear those stories. I love to, to know what's needed out in our community. And it's a time where we can say how good God has been through what's going on. So serve. And we're going to do our best as a church to keep finding ways for you to connect and to serve. But just take it upon yourself. Find someone, someone somewhere. Now, last thing is this. I want to wrap up with... Uh, the, the scripture that was read earlier. And this comes from a man by the name of James. And I love James. 
I love the book of James. It's very practical. I'm a practical guy. There's so much in it. But I love the fact that James is the brother of Jesus. And, and when you know the story of Jesus through the gospel, you'll know that at one point James and Jesus' family thought Jesus was crazy. That, that, that people are going to, you know, they're not going to take Jesus very well. They're not going to understand him. So they just kind of think he's crazy. Then all of a sudden something happened and James recognizes that his brother is indeed the son of God, the Messiah. So you got siblings? How many of you, what would it take for you to think that your brother or sister was indeed the Messiah? <laughs> I got sisters. They don't think anything of that around me. But this is James, and he's writing to people back then so they can understand this faith. And his words translate to us here uh, through digital space out in the world. And he tells us this. He says, people, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. But instead, you might say these words with me. Do what it says. Because, he says, anyone who listens to the world but doesn't do what it says. It's like somebody who looks at their face in the mirror and then after looking at themselves, goes away immediately and forgets what they look like. And I know we can understand that because most of us, one of the first things we do in the morning is look in the mirror, right? We get, and some of you look at the mirror for like 45 minutes or so until everything is just right. And you want to know when it's just right? <laughs> Whatever, you're like, oh, that's it. And you leave. Don't do that. Don't look in the mirror and then forget yourself. That's what he's saying. But whoever looks intently, he says, into the perfect law that gives freedom and, and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but actually doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So don't just listen. Don't just listen to me. Do it. I dare you. <laughs> A double dog dare you in the words of the Christmas story. So listen, may you not just listen to these words of Jesus and so deceive yourself. May you do what Jesus says. And when you do, you will find life that is really life. May we instead of saying, man, I wish Jesus never said this, be able to say, I'm glad he did. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's